Good morning and welcome to this program, Excellent Hypophosphatemia and Tumor-Induced Osteomalacia, Role of the Rheumatologist. I'm Dr. Carl Ansonia, Professor of Medicine and Endocrinology at the Yale School of Medicine, where I direct the Yale Bone Center and am Associate Director of the Yale Center for Excellent Hypophosphatemia. I'm joined, I'm joined this morning by my colleague, Suzanne Yandeberg, who's Associate Professor of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where she directs the Institute for Clinical Research. These are our disclosures. Uh, we both received funding for Ultragenics for participation in their clinical trials. Dr. Yandeberg was a consultant and I received funding for research. The program is provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education. It's supported by an educational grant from Ultragenics. Please remember to complete the pre-test and post-test evaluation of the course. These are the accreditation statements that we're required to show. The learning objectives are to describe the pathophysiology of clinical manifestations of these two diseases, to analyze the available pharmacotherapies in terms of their safety and efficacy, and to provide you with some guidelines to optimize personalized long-term care for patients with excellent hypophosphatemia and tumor-induced osteomalacia. I'll begin with an overview of phosphate homeostasis, talk about XLH primarily as it um, uh, impacts adults, talk about its incidence and prevalence, pathogenesis and clinical manifestations, talk about the safety and efficacy of treatments for both adults and to a limited extent children, and then Dr. Jan de Berg will talk about tumor-induced osteomalacia. The two major hormonal regulators of extracellular serum phosphate are parathyroid hormone and FGF23. Parathyroid hormone primarily acts to defend against hypocalcemia and does so in part by lowering serum phosphate by inducing renal phosphate wasting. However, PTH also increases production of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D to defend against hypocalcemia, which actually increases calcium and phosphate absorption from the GI tract. As you know, parathyroid hormone is made by four parathyroid glands located behind the thyroid gland. FGF23 defends against hyperphosphatemia. That's its principal raison d'etre. It has a relatively slow onset of action. It's produced by cells embedded in bone called osteocytes that have the unique ability to sense the extracellular phosphate concentration. It acts in the proximal renal tubule like PTH to induce renal phosphate wasting. But unlike PTH, it causes increased catabolism of the active form of vitamin D, 125-dihydroxy vitamin D which impairs intestinal phosphate absorption. As I just said, it is made in these cells called osteocytes embedded in bone that have this unique ability to sense the extracellular phosphate. They also have the unique ability to regulate the activity of osteoclasts and osteoblasts. The genetic basis for XLH is a loss of function mutation in a gene called PEX by a mechanism we don't understand that leads to overproduction of FGF23 by osteocytes. That leads to increased renal phosphate wasting because it suppresses the expression of the sodium phosphate co-transporters in the proximal renal tubule, and that leads to increased phosphate excretion in the urine. As I mentioned, it increases catabolism of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which lowers the circulating levels of this active vitamin D metabolite that impairs phosphate absorption, and together these two actions conspire to cause lifelong hypophosphatemia. XLH is an uncommon disease with a prevalence estimated between 1 in 20,000 and 1 in 50,000. TIO is a very rare syndrome. It's an acquired perineoplastic syndrome. Its prevalence is not known, but I see a patient with this syndrome only once every few years. One of the problems in diagnosing these disorders is that we no longer routinely measure serum phosphate as part of our extended metabolic panels. Combined with the fact that they are rare diseases can present with nonspecific symptoms, often leads to long delays in diagnoses. So now I'll turn to the biochemical and clinical manifestations of XLH. The biochemical findings in XLH are summarized in this slide, and they recapitulate the changes that I just mentioned. Hypophosphatemia is present by definition. They have a reduced renal phosphate threshold, a critically important measure. This measures the level of serum phosphate above which you begin to spell, spill phosphate in the urine. It's a simple calculation made on spot fasting, plasma in urine, creatinine and phosphate measurements. There are simple algorithms you can use to calculate it manually or online 
algorithms as well. 125 levels are low in the blood, again, because FGF23 increases the catabolism. Blood alkaline phosphatase levels are usually elevated that reflect the effects of FGF23, of hypophosphatemia to impair mineralization, cause rickets in children, osteomalacia in adults. Serum calcium, by contrast, is normal. PTH is normal or slightly elevated, perhaps because 125's levels are low, which normally suppress PTH. FGF23 levels are elevated because that's the pathogenesis of this disorder or inappropriately normal, by which I mean in the setting of hypophosphatemia, your FGF23 level should be low and an inappropriately normal value indicates an inadequate or inappropriate response to that hypophosphatemia. So chronic phosphate wasting has two somewhat different effects on the skeleton. In the growing skeleton, it affects the growth plate which manifests itself as rickets. So in XLH, you have a defect in normal cartilage growth that results in an abnormal growth plate and rickets. The growth plate is a complicated structure and the chondrocytes in the growth plate go through a program of differentiation where they progress from a resting zone to a proliferating zone to a hypertrophic zone. And then very importantly, at the end of the hypertrophic zone, they die, they apoptose. And when they apoptose, that allows new bone to form, and that's how the bone, long bones grow. So here is a photomicrograph of a normal growth plate. You can see the cells progressing from proliferating to hypertrophic, which are these balloon-like cells, and then they apoptose. And the critical point is the apoptotic signal is phosphate. You have to have an extracellular serum phos extracellular phosphate concentration adequate enough to induce apoptosis. In hypophosphatemia, there's no apoptosis, so this normal progression doesn't occur. You don't get the apoptosis. The growth plate doesn't form normally, and that leads to rickets. Shown in a case of a three-year-old child here with classic rickets, widening of the metaphysis, fraying of the epiphyses with these indistinct epiphyseal growth plates. You can see it in the distal ends of the femurs, distal lens of the radius and ulna, and that leads to these classic bowing deformities in the lower extremities. After epiphyseal closure, the hypophosphatemia's effects are primarily reflected in impaired bone formation and remodeling. Our skeleton is living tissue. It builds up and breaks down throughout life, and that process calls for new bone formation. Normally, the way we do that is we lay down this provisional scaffolding called osteoid, that's sort of like putty made primarily of collagen, that rapidly mineralizes to new bone and then consolidates into more mature, dense bone. In osteomalacia, like when you have inadequate serum phosphate concentrations, you can't mineralize the osteoid, and so it builds up like a glacier on top of your bone. So your bone is coated by this putty-like material, little new bone forms, and this soft putty-like material impairs the biomechanical qualities of bone leading to fractures and pseudofractures. So now let's turn to the disease in adults. Uh, and that's the major focus of my talk because the complications of the musculoskeletal complications of this disease are most severe and most debilitating in adults. And those include fractures, enthesopathy, which is calcification of ligaments and tendons that result, results in limitation of joint range of motion, chronic back pain with the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments of the spine become calcified, even lead to spinal cord compression when the posterior ligament is calcified. There's accelerated osteoarthritis in patients with XLH, not simply because of the biomechanical abnormalities caused by Boeing deformities in childhood, but because there's intrinsic abnormalities in the articular cartilage, as I'll mention. Dental abscesses occur, hearing loss occurs, and in the aggregate, this leads to markedly impaired functional status. And that's highlighted in this study that was done in uh, 209 patients enrolled in phase three trials for a new drug for XLH, in which physicians enrolling the patients queried those patients about their history of fracture, osteoarthritis, enthesopathy, and spinal stenosis. And you can see that by middle age, um, these patients had very high prevalence of fractures with about 40% reporting a history of fracture, between 56 and 70 percent reporting a history of osteoarthritis, enthesopathy in a third, and almost a quarter uh, reporting a history of spinal stenosis. And this is really a silent condition until it becomes symptomatic. So I suspect its prevalence is much higher than that. 
And this is the end result of these problems. You can see that these terrible antheses in the femur are going to markedly limit the range of motion of this hip. You can see this pseudo-fracture that progressed to a complete fracture requiring this plate. You can see anthesopathy in the upper extremities. And one of the places we see it earliest is in the calcaneus, where you actually can see these antheses developing in 20 year olds. Spinal ligament calcification, as I mentioned, leads to chronic back pain. Both the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments can be calcified. The posterior ligament calcification can lead to spinal cord compression. I had a patient develop cervical myelopathy because one of these uh, calcifications uh, compressed his cervical spine. As I mentioned, osteoarthritis is present. This is tricarpmental uh, osteoarthritis um, involving all three compartments of the joint in the right knee. This is a thin 50-year-old man, otherwise well. And you can see it particularly severely in this sunrise view where you see this large osteophyte present. The pathogenesis of the enthesopathy and the arthropathy in XLH is not clear, but it may relate to the nature of these structures' ability to handle mechanical loads. So the enthesis, um, which is the transition from tendon to bone, occurs uh, through a series of changes in the biomechanical properties of the tendon as it moves from pure tendon to unmineralized fibrocartilage to mineralized fibrocartilage before the attachment on bone. And this gradation of increasingly stiff material allows for accommodation of the tension that's placed on the tendon. And these same structures you can see here in this micro uh, photomicrograph. So the tendon is evolved to accommodate these mechanical loads and this fibrocartilage is very important to accommodating that load. Similarly, in the articular cartilage, there's a gradation of the articular cartilage with a very critical zone called the tide mark zone, which is very much analogous to this mineralized fibro cartilage, which is mineralized cartilage that abuts the bone and allows for an accommodation of the compressive force that's placed on that articular cartilage. So that tide mark zone helps to accommodate the forces generated in the articular surface. There are differing views on the pathogenesis of anthesopathy in XLH. One is that it's largely a biological response to impaired tissue quality. So basically it says that that tendon is trying to attach to that putty-like osteoid instead of normal bone. And the anthesopathy then reflects an, a response to that altered bone matrix. And the anthesophytes normalize the strength of the tendons at the expense of, the impaired, uh, at the expense of an impaired range of motion and mobility. The other hypothesis is that there are inherent differences in the progenitor cells of the tendon in XLH with evidence for increased bone morphogenetic protein signaling that is corrected with 125 dihydroxyvitamin D and to a lesser extent with a blocking antibody at FGF23. The hype, the hype mouse is a model of XLH and this is immunocytochemistry showing increased staining for phosphosmad, which is a downstream target of BMP signaling in the hype mouse compared to the normal mouse and patched another target for BMP signaling, this increase in the expression of the antheses in the hype mouse compared to the wild hype mouse. In the articular cartilage, it seems that what is missing is the mineralized uh, tide mark cartilage. This is again the hype mouse, this is normal mouse, uh, and a special form of CT scan that allows us to separate the unmineralized cartilage from the mineralized cartilage, which is shown in bright orange. And in the hype mouse, there's a complete absence of this calcified cartilage. So that buffer zone is missing, which may explain why the patients with XLH develop accelerated OA. You can see that you can get reappearance of this calcified cartilage with treatment with calcitriol and phosphorus. So how do we treat adults with XLH? Up until 1980, there was no well-described or supported therapy for either children or adults with XLH. In 1980, a study done in Canada demonstrated that calcitriol and phosphorus were very effective at treating children with XLH. But for the next 15 to 20 years, it was assumed that once epiphyseal closure occurred, uh, there was no need to continue treatment since the rickets was gone. But it was clear to us treating adults with XLH that um, the disease didn't go away. In fact, patients with XLH in adulthood had some of the more severe complications. So in 1992, we did an open-label four-year trial 
examining the efficacy of phosphate and calcium trial in symptomatic adults with XLH. As I mentioned, the critical histologic finding in XLH is osteomalacia, this buildup of this putty-like material in bone. And what we showed in, is that with four years of treatment, you got a significant reduction in the thickness and volume of osteoid. So these percentages represent the percent reduction from baseline. We, biop we did bone biopsies on these patients before and after treatment and showed a 50% improvement in all these parameters uh, show, uh, boxed in red with treatment. And in particular, osteoid thickness was reduced by 50%. So this therapy is effective in adults. And in addition, although it was an open label, not a double blind trial, patients uh, treated in this trial did report significant symptomatic improvement. However, there are significant limitations with this therapy. Adherence is difficult. It requires calcium trial twice a day and phosphate up to four times a day, which usually causes GI upset and often causes diarrhea. It improves but does not prevent dental disease. We've done a bunch of longitudinal and cross-sectional studies that have shown that. It does not prevent hearing loss or enthesopathy. And it's frequently accompanied by complications, including severe secondary and even tertiary hyperparathyroidism and nephrocalcinosis. And that's because physicians unfamiliar with this therapy give way too much phosphate and not enough calcium trial. Because of that unmet need, about seven or eight years ago, a company called Ultragenics partnered with a group in Japan who had developed a monoclonal blocking antibody to FGF23 that didn't completely neutralize all circulating FGF23, but just enough to normalize levels. And basically what that does is correct the biochemical abnormalities in this disease. By blocking excess FGF23, it allows the repositioning of the sodium phosphate co-transporters in the proximal tubule, allowing for increased phosphate reclamation, decreased phosphate excretion in the urine. It relieves the suppression of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D production, leading to increased secretion, in, increased production of this metabolite that improves intestinal phosphate absorption. And together, these two things lead to a normalization of serum phosphate, which one would anticipate would provide good efficacy in treatment. And that was substantiated in a phase three double-blind placebo-controlled trial and 134 symptomatic adults with XLH who were off treatment for at least two weeks before enrolling in the trial. The principal endpoint was normalization of serum phosphate above the lower limit of normal two weeks after each dose. Patients were assigned to either one milligram per kilogram of borosumab or an equivalent volume of placebo given once a month. And the slide here shows the change in serum phosphate at the midpoint of the dosing interval, that is at every two weeks, you can see the group in orange who received the active drug rapidly normalized and maintained a normal serum phosphate. The placebo group did not. When the placebo group crossed over to active drug, but the blind was maintained, their serum phosphate rapidly normalized. There were a number of endpoints assessed in this trial. The most significant, I think, is the change in fractures, in, is the improvement in fracture healing in these patients. So all patients had complete skeletal service at the beginning of this trial, and fractures were enumerated by a panel of three radiologists blinded to treatment assignment. The group who received active drug healed 43% of their fractures and pseudofractures in the first 24 weeks. The placebo group healed only 7.7%, such that at the end of the first 24 weeks, you were 17 times more likely to have healed your fracture if you were in the active treatment group. But the most significant finding was that when the placebo group were crossed over to active drug, they rapidly healed their fractures and pseudofractures at a rate that was quite comparable to the rate seen in the first 24 weeks in the active only treatment group. The active only treatment group continued to heal their fractures and at the end of the 48 weeks of this trial, 63% of the fractures and pseudofractures in the active only treatment groups had healed and 35% in the crossover group. A number of other endpoints were assessed using the WOMAC uh, validated instrument and those included stiffness, which improved in the active treatment group, did not in the placebo group, both groups after crossover showed a continued improvement that was significantly different from baseline, improved over baseline at 48 weeks. Similarly, pain improved in the active treatment group continuously, didn't improve in the placebo group, but did improve when they crossed over. Again, both uh, groups showed significant improvement from baseline at the end of the 48 weeks. The six minute walk test, how far you can walk in six minutes, improved modestly but significantly in the active only treatment group, again, showed an improvement after crossover to active drug in the placebo group. And again, the improvement was modest, uh, but this of course is a reflection of the fact that a lot of these people had fixed deficits. 
such as existing OA, existing uh, enthesopathy. But in the end, functional improvement significantly improved both in both groups at the end of 48 weeks. In a separate study, we did bone biopsies in patients who had been off therapy for two weeks to look at whether there was an improvement in osteomalacia, again, the critical histologic finding in these patients, and osteoid volume, osteoid thickness, osteoid surface, all improved with active drug shown in green. And most importantly, mineralizing lag time improved dramatically. Mineralizing lag time is the time it takes to mineralize your new bone. The normal value is about uh, 50 days. The value in the untreated patients before therapy was a thousand, over a thousand days. It improved to about a hundred days, didn't completely normalize, but clearly there was a marked improvement in the ability to mineralize bone. Borosumab is considerably safer and easier to administer than conventional therapy. During the double line portion of the trial, AEs were balanced except for an increased incidence of hyperphosphatemia in a few patients and a trend toward more frequent complaints of restless legs. In the combined phase three trials, there was no increase in nephrocalcinosis or nephrolithiasis, no increase in cardiac calcifications, and no neutralizing antibodies to the drug. Urinary calcium measured at the end of the dosing cycles was not elevated. However, I have seen mid-dose hypercalcuria. And I also do hear complaints of restless legs, not infrequently in my practice. So how do we decide about the efficacy of treatment and who should be treated? Before the, uh, the availability of this dr drug, we had developed guidelines for the treatment of XLH, which I think are still relevant in the borosumab era, but I think the threshold for treatment probably should be lowered. And those include patients with insufficiency fractures, patients with significant musculoskeletal symptoms, including weakness of bone pain, patients with biochemical evidence of bone disease, specifically high bone specific alphos, particularly in the setting of a very low serum phosphate, I think represents biochemical evidence for severe bone disease that should be treated. Preoperatively for planned orthopedic surgery, we found that patients on borosumab heal postoperatively much better than they did with either no therapy or conventional therapy. I don't have time to talk about the trials in children except for this one trial. It was a head-to-head -head trial of conventional therapy shown in uh, yellow and borosumab shown in uh, orange with borosumab given every two weeks. All these patients were uh, on conventional therapy before they were enrolled in this trial. And you can see that in this 64-week trial, both at 40 weeks and 64 weeks, the radio crap, radiographic global impression of change score was significantly greater in the borosumab group at both time points. And this RGIC represents the improvement in rickets, again, adjudicated by blinded radiologists. And when you looked at those patients who responded the best to borosumab, the chance of healing your uh, rickets was 39 times greater at week 40 and 34 weeks greater at week 34 compared to those on conventional therapy. And again, all these patients had already been on conventional therapy before they were randomized into this trial. So how do we assess the efficacy of uh, borosumab in adults? Well, fracture healing, as I just showed you, is a very important endpoint. Normalization of the bone-specific alphosphate is a parameter I use. I generally follow peak two-week post-dose PTH, phosphate, calcium, creatinine, and 24-hour urine for the first three to four months. I like to see trough phosphate values close to or above the lower limit of normal. I follow renal ultrasounds, even though there was no change in the one-year study. Again, we're talking about lifelong therapy here in adults. I have not reduced the interval of treatment in patients who have serum phosphate lower than target as long as they are responding clinically, but I have reduced the treatment interval or increased the dose to more than a milligram per kilogram in patients who don't meet target and are not symptomatically improved. Rarely I see a patient who looks like they responded and then simply are not responding. I wonder whether those patients have developed neutralizing antibodies. It's very rare, but we clearly need an assay to detect neutralizing antibodies. The FDA labeled indications are that this drug can be used in patients with rickets over the age of six months. The pediatric dose starts at 0.8 milligrams per kilogram given every two weeks with a minimum dose of 10 and a maximum dose of 90. The dose may be increased to two milligrams per kilogram. In adults, the starting dose is one milligram per kilogram every four weeks with a, mass dose, with a maximum dose of 90 milligrams. So what are the uncertainties and challenges we still face? We don't know whether we should stop therapy when the growth plates are closed. 
Should we change to adult dosing when growth plates are closed or when children turn 18? Should there be a drug holiday in young adults? Young adults feel well after they've been treated as uh, children and adolescents. They go off to college. They don't really want to be bothered with continued therapy. They feel well. There's a honeymoon period of maybe 10 years before they develop symptoms. If the etiology of osteoarthritis and enthesopathy has a biomechanical basis, will berosumab prevent these devastating complications? When we need a prospective study of spinal disease, especially posterior longitudinal calcifications and spinal stenosis, I think we need to know whether this drug prevents that and what its natural history is otherwise. And we need a more consistent multimodal approach to pain management. And with that, I'll turn the program over to Dr. Yandever. Well, thank you, Dr. and Sonia, for that wonderful review of X-linked hypophosphatemia. Now I'd like to turn our attention to tumor-induced osteomalacia. So let's start with the case. So this is a gentleman I saw a number of years ago, a 33-year-old male who presented with progressive muscle weakness and generalized pain. He'd undergone multiple evaluations by multiple physicians and his symptoms became progressive to the point where he had pain, became unable to walk independently, and uh, at one point was wheelchair bound. He was given the provisional diagnosis of multiple sclerosis and started on treatment, but was not improving. Two years into his course, he developed severe hip pain, and this was found to be a hip fracture. On further imaging, he had multiple fractures, including bilateral pelvic fractures, rib fractures, vertebral compression fractures, metacarpal and metatarsal fractures. A biopsy of his bone uh, obtained during hip surgery showed osteomalacia or poor mineralization of the bone. When I saw him, he had normal vital signs and he was of normal stature, and his physical exam was largely unremarkable except for a few things. He had suffered about a four-inch height loss because of multiple vertebral compression fractures, and he also was kyphotic. Um, when I was palpating his oral cavity and his extremities, he had some pain in his right foot, which was pretty typical of plantar fasciitis, pain when I palpated the calcaneus and the insertion of the tendon there, um, but no palpable masses that I could appreciate. He had no bowing of his extremities and he had normal dentition. On lab evaluation, he came to me with these labs. He had a low serum phosphorus and it took a long time before any physician thought to actually send a serum phosphorus. But when he was evaluated by me, I, he came with that lab value. So he had a low serum phosphorus. He had a normal serum calcium and a normal intact parathyroid hormone. His alkaline phosphatase on his chemistry panel was also elevated, and he had a low 25-hydroxyvitamin D and normal renal function. So just to orient you, when I think about hypophosphatemia, I think about three major mechanisms, and it's important to kind of sift through the mechanisms because it points you in different directions of what the differential diagnosis might be in someone who presents with hypophosphatemia, especially in the setting of progressive myopathy and progressive pain, bone pain and fractures. So the three major mechanisms are cellular um, shifts or cellular redistribution. This usually happens in the setting of severe sepsis, DKA, refeeding syndrome, where phosphorus is shifted extracellularly to intracellularly. The second mechanism I think of is decreased GI absorption. So for example, if you've had gastric bypass, celiac disease, short gut syndrome, anything that could cause malabsorption. You can also malabsorb phosphorus. You can malabsorb vitamin D, which can lead to hypophosphatemia. Anything that can cause GI, uh, decreased GI absorption, even medications that can um, bind up phosphorus and decrease GI absorption um, go in that differential. And then the final major mechanism is increased renal excretion. And this is where these disorders that we talked about today lie. And um, when, when you're thinking about the differential diagnosis of this, it's important to demonstrate that there's increased renal excretion before you go further down the workup uh, for um, renal phosphate wasting. So what we did in this gentleman is we measured a tubular reabsorption of phosphorus, and this can be done by simultaneously measuring a fasting serum phosphorus, a fasting serum creatinine, a, a, a second morning spot two-hour urine um, for creatinine and for phosphorus. And you 
you basically do a calculation and you come up with your tubular reabsorption of phosphorus. In an individual that's hypophosphatemic, you will be reabsorbing phosphorus at a very high rate. So greater than 85% tubular reabsorption of phosphorus should be seen in someone that's hypophosphatemic. Here we see this gentleman has a tubular reabsorption of phosphorus of only 58%. This supports this um, renal phosphate loss as a mechanism. So when we think about what are the, what's the differential diagnosis of chronic hypophosphatemia with increased renal losses, it's a broad differential diagnosis, but the major buckets are primary and secondary hyperparathyroidism, um, FGF23 excess disorders, which tumor-induced osteomalacia falls in that category, disorders of the sodium uh, phosphate dependent transporters on the renal brush border membrane um, is also in the differential proximal renal tubular dysfunction, either through acquired or congenital causes, and a number of drugs. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a background, and Dr. and Sonia did uh, before, about how um, FGF23 and PTH and, and vitamin D and calcium kind of are controlled in an interplay. So this is our current view of mineral metabolism. So our mineral metabolism view used to be pretty PTH centric, where we thought about serum calcium regulating secretion of PTH from the parathyroid glands and it having activity on the kidney to promote conversion of 25 hydroxy vitamin D to 125 hydroxy vitamin D that then would act on the gut to increase uh, calcium and phosphorus reabsorption. We also think of PTH and its direct actions on the sodium phosphate transporters to move them off the brush border membrane internally so phosphorus is not reabsorbed and there's increased phosphorus um, uh, excretion at the level of the kidney. We also think about PTH action on bone to increase osteoclastic resorption of calcium and phosphorus. And all this um, really serves to normalize serum calcium. But what we begin to appreciate is that there's another hormone that regulates phosphorus and vitamin D, and that is FGF23. FGF23 is produced by the bone, and it has actions that are similar to PTH, and it has actual actions that are different than PTH. So FGF23 and its actions that are similar to PTH have an inhibitory effect on those sodium phosphate transporters. So moves them off the brush border membrane, just like PTH does, increasing um, phosphorus excretion, decreasing phosphorus absorption, therefore increasing urinary losses of phosphorus. What's different about FGF23 and PTH is that FGF23 actually inhibits the 1-alpha hydroxylase in the kidney and decreases the conversion of 25D to 125D. Not only does it decrease that conversion, it also increases 125D's catabolism to an inactive form of 24-25 hydroxy vitamin D. So it's a very potent regulator of activated vitamin D. And as you can see, through that dual action of blocking the sodium phosphate transporters and increasing urinary excretion, and blocking the compensatory mechanism of increasing 125D to then increase absorption in the gut, you really can have profound phosphate, renal phosphate wasting and hypophosphatemia from FGF23 excess. So to try to um, call down our differential diagnosis of chronic hypophosphatemia, it's really important to measure the PTH and it's important to measure the 125 hydroxy vitamin D because if the PTH is elevated and the 125 hydroxy vitamin D is either normal or inappropriately low, we know that we think that this is going to be an FGF23 mediated process. So whenever FGF23 is elevated, 125D should either be inappropriately normal or low. So in our individual that we that I presented at the beginning, we measured the 125 hydroxy vitamin D. So you can see in his profile, he has a normal PTH and he has a low 125 hydroxy vitamin D, speaking to the fact that this is probably an FGF23 excess mechanism. So we also measured FGF23 and this FGF23 measured by the C-terminal assay, the um, immunotopics assay was elevated. So we know we're dealing with an FGF23 mediated um, hypophosphatemia with renal phosphate wasting. And that differential is also broad, but there's just a few things in the differential that um, causes acquired 
FGF23 excess, and the major one of those is tumor-induced osteomalacia. Now, Dr. Insonia spoke to you about inherited forms of hypophosphatemia causing FGF23 excess, and XLH is the major form of that. And as I pointed out on this gentleman's physical examination, he had no bowed legs, he had no family history, he was of normal stature, he had no dental phenotype. Um, and he uh, presented uh, rather, um, rather acutely with this uh, proximal muscle weakness that progressed over a couple of years. So my leading diagnosis when I saw my gentleman was that this was tumor-induced osteomalacia. And in this syndrome, tumors that are mesenchymal origin, usually small, make ectopic FGF23. And through making this ectopic FGF23 promote renal phosphate wasting, hypophosphatemia, that eventually leads to bone demineralization. And this is a bone biopsy in this lower panel. And all this red osteoid is unmineralized bone and the blue is mineralized bone. In the normal situation, you'd have an ever so thin layer, thinner than this, covering the mineralized bone. But in osteomalacia, there's all this unmineralized protein matrix that makes the bone soft. Um, so it's prone to fracture and it also is prone to bending. So here is an octreotide scan just showing this small mesenchymal tumor up in the head of the, of the humerus here, causing all the phosphate wasting hypophosphatemia and this bone demineralization. So what happens in, um, in TIO is that these tumors make FGF23, and then it has a dual effect that I talked about. It lowers the sodium phosphate transporter expression in the kidney, therefore causing phosphaturia. In addition, it downregulates the 1 alpha hydroxylase and upregulates the 24 hydroxylase to decrease the production of active vitamin D or 125 hydroxy vitamin D. And that also blunts that compensatory increase that could increase phosphorus absorption in the gut, leading to profound hypophosphatemia. So, what's the clinical presentation? Very much like my gentleman presented. So you might see someone like this in your clinic, someone that, that presents with muscle pain, muscle weakness, bone pain. Sometimes the people can't distinguish bone pain from joint pain, it's just a generalized pain. And a lot of times, you know, it starts in the distal extremities and may move um, more proximally, um, or people may just present with generalized pain. Eventually, people then develop fractures, and this is when people start to then look at the bones. Fatigue is a major component of this, and as I said, this progressive weakness where people can become wheelchair-bound. And fractures lead to deformity, and so you can get kyphosis, you can get um, decreasing pulmonary, pulmonary function because the, um, the Rib, rib cage and the vertebral column collapses and therefore restricts the pulmonary function. So just to contrast with what Dr. Insonia was talking about, usually when I think about TIO and XLH, there's a couple of features I think about to distinguish the two. One is kind of age of onset. Typically TIO is gonna be an onset in adulthood, whereas XLH is gonna be onset in childhood. There is gonna be a family history in um, a large portion of individuals with XLH where there should not be a family history in TIO. I will drill down on this a bit and say that in family history, a lot of times you have to um, really ask them, is there anyone with bowed legs? Was there anyone with short stature? Was there anyone with severe dental issues um, to really get an idea if there is or no family history? And then also the clinical symptoms in TIO tend to be more acute onset and more rapidly progressive. So the treatment in TIO is complete tumor resection because this will then reverse the biochemical phenotype, eventually lead to remineralization of bone and improvement of the clinical symptoms. So treatment of choice is tumor resection. If tumor resection is incomplete, if you can't find the tumor, or if there's recurrence and it's not resectable, then medical therapy is needed. I will say tumors are, are usually small and difficult to locate. Many times they're located in the lower extremities, in the head, but they can be located in many places. Many times they are either a butt bone or in bone. It's about 50-50 in the soft tissue and 50-50 in the bone. 
My approach to finding the tumor is to first do functional imaging and then to do targeted imaging of areas that light up on functional imaging. So these tumors express the matostatin receptors, so we can exploit this by using imaging that lights up things with somatostatin receptors. So octreotide scan will do that, and a new modality called a gallium-68 dotatate PET-CT will also do that. The gallium-68 dotatate PET-CT is superior to octreotide scanning, um, and in some series have shown to be able to locate the tumor about 85% of the time. Once you get uptake on one of the scans, then you can do more focused imaging, either with MRI, CT, wherever the anatomical uptake is and the best imaging for that area. Um, I will say overall, using functional imaging, you can find the tumor in about 50% of time with a combined of our triotide scan, uh, but I think we're gonna be get better at finding tumors when the gallium-68 dotatate PET-CT is more widely available and used. I will say that you have to say to your radiologist, you need to get images from the tip of the head to the tip of the fingers and the tip of the toes and don't miss any area. This is an interesting uh, case published by um, Mike Collins's group showing that this individual, they uh, did not image the elbows. And unfortunately in this individual, that is where the uptake was on the scan when they finally were able to repeat the imaging. So no part of the body should be missed in imaging because it can be in the feet, it can be in the head, it can be in the elbows, it can be in the tips of the fingers. I've seen tumors in all those locations. In my individual, he had pain in his right foot. I palpated, I thought it was plantar fasciitis, and I got an MRI that day, which indeed did show plantar fasciitis. He had to come back for his octreotide scan, and at the time I worked up this individual, octreotide scan was the only thing that was available. Um, and there was uptake in his left foot on the octreotide scan. So then we did the focused imaging with the MRI and found a three centimeter phosphateric mesenchymal tumor beneath his first metatarsal. So when you find the tumor, it's fantastic because if you can find the tumor and you can resect it, you can cure these individuals and they have an incredibly um, great outcome when you're able to find the tumor and resect it. So you need to employ a surgeon that can get it the first time. First time is your best shot. You wanna do a wide excision and make sure you get all the tumor. Sometimes because it's close proximity to bone or in bone, it's difficult to get it, or you abut vascular or um, nerves, and that precludes you from doing a complete surgical resection. This just demonstrates these are individuals that had um, FGF 23 levels before surgery and after surgery, you can see dramatic improvement in FGF 23 levels with a complete resection. So uh, my gentleman underwent surgery, complete resection and did very well. This is off calcitriol and phosphorus. His phosphorus normalized, um, his FGF 23 dropped um, and his 125D we didn't measure, um, but it had normalized on therapy previously. And he really did quite well. Several months later, six months later, he um, got married, he went on a honeymoon. He sent me um, a postcard from his honeymoon and was doing very well and it continues to do well to this day. So in summary, suspect TIO with acquired hypophosphatemia when you can demonstrate renal phosphate wasting and an appropriately low 125 hydroxy vitamin D. The tumors produce FGF23 and cures achieved when complete tumor is resected. Use a stepwise approach to tumor localization and complete resection is your goal. But when localization fails or resection is incomplete or there's reoccurrence, then medical therapy is indicated. Um, so as I mentioned before, in about 50% of cases, we can not find the tumor. Um, and in some instances, it's inoperable. Also, in about 18% of cases, there's actually recurrence after you found the tumor and you've resected. So in this situation, medical therapy is indicated. Our traditional medical therapy has been phosphorus and calcitriol. So just replacing the phosphorus that's being wasted and adding the, one, the active 125 hydroxyvitamin D that is being, um, that's being suppressed. <clears throat> 
But there's a new treatment option called barosimab, which Dr. Insomnia um, described as being used in XLH. Phosphorus is our conventional treatment. And I have to say that it's, um, it's a little bit of an onerous therapy. We usually start with one to three grams in four divided doses over the course of the day, and we use calcitriol in two doses. So individuals are taking four doses of medication a day. Our goal is to replace the phosphorus to the lower limit, to normalize the alkaline phosphatase, and then keep the urine calcium in the normal range. To do this, it requires quite a bit of monitoring. And individuals that I have on conventional therapy, I need to monitor blood and urine about every three months. And then I also monitor their kidneys because um, there can be hypercalcemia and nephrocalcinosis. There's really a narrow therapeutic range with calcitriol um, and hypercalcemia can be common as can uh, hypercalcemia. As I mentioned, there's limitations to medical treatment in the tolerability, multiple doses a day, narrow therapeutic window, and then also development of complications of therapy. So in these instances, um, it's great to have an option um, that doesn't require um, such onerous treatment. So barosimab is a fully human monoclonal antibody that binds FGF23 and inactivates it. And in so doing, it both improves the synthesis of 125-hydroxyvitamin D and increases the sodium phosphate um, transporter expression on the breast border membrane of the kidney. So you get decreased phosphorus excretion, increased phosphorus absorption, and restoration of the serum phosphorus. This is the um, phase two trial demonstrating efficacy of barosimab in tumor-induced osteomalacia. We enrolled 14 individuals with tumor-induced osteomalacia that had recurrence, um, tumors that were unable to be located or um, had unresectable tumors. And what we did is at baseline, we did a bone biopsy. We did a 16 week titration period with barosimab every month um, with doses starting at 0.3 milligram per kilogram and titrating up to achieve a serum phosphorus in the lower limit of normal. And then after 40 weeks, 48 weeks of treatment, we did a post-treatment bone biopsy and then a two year extension period. This is looking at one of our uh, major endpoints, this uh, change in serum phosphorus. And as, as you can see, after a 16 week titration period, the serum phosphorus was normalized and was able to stay in the normal range over 144 weeks. This also showed that the TMP GFR or the tubular reabsorption of phosphorus improved, but did not quite normalize with uh, barosimab treatment. When we looked at the bone biopsies, we saw that there was improvement in um, markers of osteomalacia. So the osteoid volume decreased, the osteoid thickness, so this is the amount of um, unmineralized bone, the, the amount of unmineralized bone decreased. The osteoid surface for bone surface didn't in, did not improve. And we think this has to do with the length of treatment. Um, at this point, individuals had a 16 week titration and were treated with 32 weeks with their um, target barosimab dose. In addition, the mineralization lag time, which tells us how long it takes the bone to be mineralized, dropped as well. When we looked at fracture healing, what we found is that over the course of the 144 weeks, that fractures and pseudo fractures um, were able to heal. And at 144 weeks, 96 and 144 weeks, approximately 50% of the pseudo fractures or fractures were either partially healed or fully healed. This is just an example of an individual a baseline with many fractures in the ribs that you can see by the uptake on bone scan. And after treatment, uh, these fractures were healed. We also saw improvement in some patient reported outcomes. So there was improvement in fatigue as measured by the brief fatigue inventory, improvement in global fatigue, worse fatigue, fatigue severity, and fatigue interference. So the FDA labeled indications, um, this was approved in June 2020 for the treatment of tumor-induced osteomalacia and those that either have unresectable tumor, tumor that are not able to be located, or tumors that are inoperable. And the adult dosing is to start at 0.5 milligrams per kilogram subcutaneously every four weeks, and it increased it up to two milligrams per kilogram 
uh, not to exceed 180 milligrams, uh, and you can administer it every two weeks if needed to achieve the um, target phosphorus dose. So in summary, tumor-induced osteomalacia is rare, it's serious, and it's debilitating. And you as rheumatologists may see individuals come to you with weakness, with bone pain. It is driven by excess FGF23, and this leads to renal phosphate wasting, impaired synthesis of 125-hydroxyvitamin D, and hypophosphatemia. Chronic hypophosphatemia leads to osteomalacia, fractures, and pseudofractures, and this leads to disability due to fatigue, proximal muscle weakness, musculoskeletal pain, and decreased mobility. Suspect TIO when you see an individual with these symptoms and acquired hypophosphatemia, and you can demonstrate that there's renal phosphate wasting and an inappropriately low 125-hydroxyvitamin D. Cure is achieved if you can completely resect the tumor. And using a step-rise approach of looking at functional imaging and then target imaging is recommended. When localization fails or resection is incomplete or there's recurrence, medical therapy is indicated. Conventional therapy is with calcitriol and phosphorus, and now there's a new option with borosumab treatment. In studies of borosumab, um, we found that it improved phosphorus homeostasis, it improved osteomalacia, as well as fracture and pseudofracture healing, as, and patient reported outcomes of pain, fatigue, and physical health improved. In addition, physical mobility improved as well. And with this, I'll thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to discussion questions. for everyone who's attended this session. Now we're gonna spend a few minutes doing some live q and I'm joined by my co-presenter, Dr. Carl and Sonia, and I'm gonna read a couple of questions from the, um, from the Q&A box. So please add your Q&A for any questions that you have, and we'd love to have a discussion. So Carl, when you see patients with X-linked hypophosphatemia, um, how do these patients normally present? How would they present to say a rheumatologist? I'd say uh, the most common symptoms they would visit a rheumatologist for would include chronic back pain that was getting progressively more severe and pain in the joints of the lower extremities, particularly hip and knee, uh, often accompanied by, um, particularly at the hip, uh, a sensation of reduced range of motion. And uh, as was sort of covered in my talk, th those symptoms usually relate to uh, osteoarthritis of the spine and the lower extremity joints. And as I alluded to, there seems to be an intrinsic abnormality in the articular cartilage in this disease that co-conspires with the mechanical abnormalities in the lower extremities to lead to accelerated OI, OA. And in addition, there's this peculiar propensity to enthesopathy. So I think you would wind up seeing patients for back and uh, lower extremity joint pain and a range of motion that you would quickly identify as being associated with enthesopathy. I know for patients with tumor-induced osteomalacia, you know, a lot of times their symptoms begin to present before they begin to break their bones. And so it's when they begin to break their bones that they start getting um, shunted in the right direction. So for, I would think that a nephrologist, not a, a rheumatologist might see someone who has progressive muscle weakness, maybe there's concern that there might be myositis or there's decreased ambulation with uh, a lot of um, non-specific pain, not necessarily joint pain, but with this decreased mobility, decreased ambulation, someone might refer to a rheumatologist saying like, I don't know what's going on with this person. They, they you know, it's a 30 year old and they're, you know, becoming progressively weak and they, they hurt all over. Um, and so I think that might be a way that someone with TIO might make it to a rheumatologist. As I was discussing with Carl earlier, you know, I think that both rheumatologists and endocrinologists um, really end up being um, some of the 
people that get referred to for patients that other doctors don't really know what to do with, either their metabolism or their autoimmune. And I, I told Carl, I really get concerned when I get a referral from a rheumatologist because I know it's going to be a really tough case. And so any time that there's endocrinology, rheumatology cross, cross referral, you know it's going to be a, a tough, unusual case. Um, and another question in the Q&A was, do we work with nephrologists on these cases? Um, for me and TIO, I know that I do end up working with nephrologists, especially for people who have been on long-term phosphorus and calcitriol, because I tend to end up having some complications with hypercalciuria, with nephrocalcinosis, with long-term treatment with those. So I do end up employing a nephrologist. Um, many times when people present, and I'll, I'll let you comment, Carl, for XLH. What about with XLH? Yeah, I say my experience has been similar. I mean, what comes to mind immediately uh, is a patient that recently was referred to me who had tertiary hyperparathyroidism in the setting of um, XLH and severe uh, nephrocalcinosis, which generally I don't consider to be a cause of renal insufficiency, but uh, I had no good explanation for this woman's uh, renal insufficiency, which was really concerning to me, uh, despite my best efforts to control her tertiary hyperpara. And she came to, I sent her to nephrology, uh, she was biopsied and she had horrendous uh, parenchymal calcification, obstructing tubules. It's the most severe case of nephrocalcinosis. So I agree with you, Suzanne, that I think uh, we do need their help with patients who have renal insufficiency. I do, at least in XLH, in the setting of renal insufficiency, uh, often due to mismanagement of conventional therapy. And the other, the other circumstances is that occasionally we'll see a patient referred to us after the nephrologist determines that the cause of the renal phosphate leak is not an intrinsic uh, renal disease problem. They usually recognize that it's probably F FGF23 mediated and will refer to us for that. Yeah, I totally agree with that. There's another question in the Q&A. Once we check serum levels of phosphorus, would you work with an endocrinologist for these cases? I mean, I think that, um, you know, there are limitations in general knowledge amongst endocrinology and other specialties um, of these rare disorders of XLH and TIO. Um, so I do think that once you check the serum levels of phosphorus and you're pretty sure that you're dealing with an FGF23 mediated um, situation, I, I would refer to an endocrinologist, but just make sure that the endocrinologist is comfortable um, managing that. Carl, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I think you've done the heavy lifting. If you've identified yeah. hypophosphatemia as potentially contributing to a clinical situation that you're evaluating. The major problem, as you all know, is that phosphate is not part of the SMA20 or your usual metabolic screen anymore. So we usually miss hypophosphatemia. If you've identified hypophosphatemia, you've gone a giant step toward helping that patient. And the availability of uh, commercial FGF23 assays has further enhanced our ability to identify the etiology. But as both Suzanne and I have pointed out, uh, there are pretty simple ways you can determine whether the hypophosphatemia is due to an intrinsic renal problem or malabsorption. I think once you've realized that it's a renal phosphate wasting disorder and there's no obvious um, intrinsic renal disease associated with it, then I think it's probably reasonable to refer to a specialist who's had some experience with uh, these uh, acquired or inherited hypophosphatemic disorders mediated by FGF23. Yeah, I echo that, Carl. You know, absolutely. The real key here is like thinking about phosphorus and measuring it. Like once you've done that, you've then, you know, set the whole um, chain of events going. So I think that uh, kudos to people that make that diagnosis for sure. Carl, I just wanted to ask you a question. So, you know, XLH is a lifelong disease. And so just thinking about when rheumatologists might encounter a patient with XLH, what does XLH look like kind of throughout the lifespan from childhood, mid-adult to um, older adult? Yeah, so um, I think as has hopefully been made clear, I mean, the disease was initially thought to be primarily a disease of childhood that basically ended with epiphyseal closure. We now know, of course, it's a lifelong disease, but there is a so-called honeymoon period after epiphyseal closure. 
uh, young adults and late teens in their late teens, early 20s through their mid 20s really feel quite well um, often. They're very energetic. They feel like life is ahead of them. They're usually able to exercise. And then in their late 20s, mid 30s, they start to accumulate symptoms. Uh, they feel like they're slowing down. They have more aches and pains they think is normal. And then by their mid 40s is when you would start to see them with unusually severe OA, unusually um, severe enthesopathy that doesn't seem to be work related. That's when you're gonna start to see them. Um, the question for us as endocrinologists is when, whether or if there is a drug treatment holiday. Um, Great, well, thank you, Carl. Well, that brings us to the end of our time and we'd really like to thank the attendees for their attention and for their participation.